And our next storyteller is Frank D'Amato. Frank. Let's hear for Frank, everybody. You got it. Cool. It was 2008. I got a phone call at 6 o'clock in the morning, California time, from my stepmother in New York. Not the ideal way to start my day. Hello? They took your father away! They took your father away! I thought, this might be a good time to remain calm. <laughs> Who? The FBI! The FBI! They surrounded the block. They had big, big guns. Uh, they took your father and threw him in the back of a van. Now, when I heard this, I was deeply relieved. <laughs> I was. Because my father, at the time, was 69 years old. And two years before that, he had a major heart attack. And a year after, congestive heart failure. And ever since, I was getting panicked, 3 a.m. phone calls every time he got indigestion, which was weirdly often. The fact was, I was terrified of my father dying. Now, aside from me not wanting my father to die for human reasons like, he's my father, I love him, <laughs> shit like that. <laughs> I really, really needed my father to not die because I was completely stuck on my master's thesis. <laughs> I'll explain. My master's thesis was an autobiographical novel. The subtext of every sentence of that 363-page piece of shit was, my father is an asshole. <laughs> it wasn't much of a book. But at the time, I was under the awful delusion that what it needed, rather than a match, was an ending. <laughs> See, I needed my father not dead, so he could do that one horrible thing that would just ruin my life. <laughs> but right after it ruined it, it would save my life by giving the book the ending it needed. <laughs> it was a plan. My father was charged with usury. Um, that's legalese for loan sharking. Uh, he pleaded guilty, uh, mostly because he was. <laughs> I signed a $100,000 bail bond, and my father was uh, placed under house arrest until uh, the day of the sentencing. Now, this was extremely difficult for my father. Uh, he was just used to roaming the countrysides of Brooklyn like some wild Italian-American buffalo. <laughs> now, I'm, I have time here. Nine months later, the day of the sentencing finally arrives. We're in a federal courtroom in downtown Manhattan. My father, our lawyer, and I are sitting in this enormous, intimidating, empty courtroom. We're just waiting, and it's so quiet, we could hear the air coming in from the vent in the ceiling. And we're just waiting and waiting until finally, the side door bangs open, and the court officials parade in all rise, hear ye, hear ye. Federal court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Sarah Kincaid presiding. A lawyer stands up and speaks for my father. Your Honor, he says, here is a man who, 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 who was raised in poverty, whose father was blind, who was given no education and no direction. <laughs> um, the, the judge stops him, interrupts and says, uh, Counselor, we, we don't need to hear anymore. Um, I have no intention of sending this man to jail. And then the district attorney at that point, he stands up and says, Your Honor, the United States government has no desire to pursue this matter any further. 
I finally exhaled. Everyone in that courtroom had forgiven my father. His lawyer, the district attorney, the judge, our entire society were all saying in chorus, it wasn't his fault. He'd done the best he could with what he had. And then this enormous sadness hit me because I realized there was only one person who didn't feel the same way. My God, I thought that I had forgiven him. I thought that because I traveled all that way, because I signed the bond, it, it meant I had. But at that moment, I knew I hadn't. I loved him, but I hadn't forgiven him. My father, uh, he, he, never, uh, he never committed another crime again. Um, I never got the ending to that novel, but I got the start for a new one. <laughs>